something we we do we need to do it's part of our identity our identity but really our purpose comes from the gifts we've been given the talents we've been given the beliefs that we have and how we contribute to society with that mm. so it doesn't it's it can be at work. Yeah. It can be part of your work. And if your purpose and your work and your career go together, I mean, you can't beat that. But your purpose isn't your career. Your purpose is way bigger. Yeah. We have some amazing uh, leaders at our church. I want to highly encourage you to go back and listen to the bonus podcast throughout the series. Uh, we just have so many just gifted people doing so many really important things. In fact, we have leaders uh, ready to invest in us. Uh, even today, there's a Reconciliation and Justice Book Club that's getting together over lunch. Tamara Tate is leading. If you want to stick around and have a free lunch and talk about meaningful things, you can do that. Or tomorrow night, we have Restore kicking off for the first time in several months, uh, a way to find healing and recovery. It's going to be a a powerful time, or the new men's community group, or the new women's community group, serving on Sundays. These are all opportunities for you uh, because of incredible volunteers and leaders. And if you're interested in any of those things, of course, at the Connect Spot, they would love to help you. Well, we're in this series called Flourishing, and we did a survey. And in that survey, we'll be revealing some of the results soon, but we were talking about how are we flourishing in relationships and with our finances and physically and mentally. And today we're talking about how are we flourishing when it comes to our purpose. Now, talking about purpose, it sounds like this would be an easy conversation to have, right? Purpose is on most people's minds. But if you were to Google the phrase, what is my purpose? You will discover there are 7.7 .7 billion results. So where do you start when you talk about something so big? And there's all sorts of self-help gurus and spiritual leaders, moms with blogs, and the never-aging Tony Robbins, right? There's lots of things on purpose. But let me just give you a, a couple of thoughts to get us on the same page about purpose. So a working definition of purpose can be this. Purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or where something exists. Now, there's two kind of ways at looking at purpose, two kind of major umbrellas of purpose philosophically. One is existential, and the other is something called essentialism. Existential means there's a demand for finding a purpose out of an otherwise meaningless life. But on the other side is essentialism, which challenges us to find the purpose that already exists for us. And so for clarity's sake, this is, what, this is our working definition. Purpose is the endeavor of fulfilling the desire that God intended for each of us by placing breath in our lungs and forming us in our mother's womb. And we say all the time at Gateway that God created you on purpose and for a purpose. And this is bigger than our job. Like Jen said, it's bigger than our career. This is about living out who God created you to be. And we are created in the image of God. And so our purpose is to reflect the image of God everywhere we go. Or like in this verse, it talks about God's glory, reflecting how good, how great, how loving he is. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. In this dark and broken world, you and I can actually become the light to the world as God shines through us, as we reflect his image to the world around us. But how do we do that when life can be so difficult, when the darkness seems to be overwhelming? Well, there's a great story in the scriptures about a man named Daniel. And I want to spend some time talking about him today because Daniel was son of nobility, saw leadership in his future only for his people to be 
destroyed and to be taken, kidnapped, held hostage in Babylon. And it's in that we pick up the story in chapter 1. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Some of you recognize those last three, the VeggieTales movie, Rack Shack and Benny, right? <laughs> But I want you to imagine for a moment how difficult this must have been for these young men on their way to nobility and royalty and now enslaved, now oppressed. And more than likely, they were actually castrated. And you thought your job was bad, right? They had been forcibly removed from their homes, and now they're living in a strange land with strange language, and they're given new names. And this was a common practice. In fact, what, was, what they were trying to do is actually change their entire identity, not what their parents hoped for them, but now connected to the gods of the Babylonians. And notice what happens. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men are your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So Daniel introduced them to the Daniel plan. Now, this is not a pro-vegetarian, anti-meat message. I subscribe to the same philosophy of ethical eating as my previous pastor, who once said he will only eat those that are able to run for their life. That's ethical eating, right? And so why would Daniel not want to eat what the king was offering? Well, some of the food was probably forbidden according to the Jewish laws of what makes a person clean and unclean. So Babylonians love to eat pig, which sounds delicious. But they also love to eat horse, not so much. And so for him, it could have been the Jewish taboo food decrees. Or it could be that they were eating meat sacrificed to the gods of the Babylonians. Or it could be that simply eating the king's food was accepting the king's patronage. It was a declaration publicly of dependence on the king. And perhaps Daniel did not want to be seen as dependent on King Nebuchadnezzar, but instead on his god. We're not exactly sure, but what we know is he was willing to take this risk. It actually says he resolved, he set his heart not to eat the food, even if that meant he might be imprisoned or killed, but it, they were given a chance. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them all vegetables instead. They all were forced to have the Daniel plan. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better 
than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. I love this. These four young Hebrew men facing incredible challenges were actually seen as far superior to everyone else. They were able to live out the Imago Dei wherever they were. It didn't matter they were no longer in their, their own royal court, no longer seen as nobility and honored, but captives in a foreign land, they still saw their purpose as reflecting God's goodness, his glory, his greatness, his beauty, his love. And they could have played by the new rules, right? Vegas has taught us that. What happens in Vegas? What? Stays in Vegas. That's what they want you to think. The wounds and the scars, they come with you too, right? But Daniel and his friends have every excuse to eat and live differently, but their response is, just test us. Verse 12, just test your servants for 10 days. Give us a chance. And God saw their faithfulness to not only him, but to the original Imago Dei, the original design, the image of God. And he gave them an ability, a supernatural ability, to actually understand visions and dreams, to have a knowledge and understanding, 10 times more so than those around them. See, when we trust God, God does something in us. We become vessels for him to move in ways that we do not give permission when we're not trusting him. See, Daniel wasn't trusting God to get something from God. But what happens is when you step out in faith, you're walking in the context of God's presence. This garners his attention. It activates something in us and through us. In verse 18, again, it, the king saw them and talked with them and realized these men are far superior to all the others. What if the way that we lived and the way we talked and the way we treated others at our work made our boss say, you know what? I'm not sure about following Jesus, but the way these people live is so different. They're even better at their job than others. See, these were not good circumstances for them. And yet they stayed steadfast. See, here's what's frustrating about our purpose is our purpose never changes even if our circumstances do. See, our purpose is steadfast, but the way we are challenged to live it out is fluid. So being carried off to Babylon was not part of the plan. But in Babylon, God was able to do something in them that actually made them better than they would have been had they stayed in Jerusalem. See, one of the great things about God is he can take something that's terrible that others may have meant for evil and somehow bring beautiful things from it when we trust him. See, your purpose is not what you do. It's what happens when you trust your life into God's hands. See, God did something significant in these young men in Babylon. In Jerusalem, they were being bred to be without physical defect, to be handsome and qualified. But in Babylon, God was doing something in them to where they could lead a nation filled with God's righteousness. In Jerusalem, they would have had the best learning and they would have been well informed. But in Babylon, in the midst of the suffering, by trusting God, God brought supernatural ability into their life. In Jerusalem, they would have smelled like money and riches, but in Babylon, they were thrown into the fires but came out smelling like they had been with the Son of God. In Jerusalem, their future was still being written, but in Babylon, they were writing a story that we're talking about now 2,500 years later. And what is true of God then is true of Him now. He has created you on purpose. And with a purpose. But let's be honest. Sometimes it's hard to live out that purpose when circumstances are challenging. When life is so hard. Sometimes we're just trying to survive. Many of you know that my dad died a couple weeks ago. He'd been struggling with memory issues for the last few years. But he was still physically in, in great shape. He was playing pickleball up until... Easter, mowing the lawn, fixing things around the house. Very active and healthy, 74-year-old. In fact, I have uh, uh, videos of him uh, at Barton Springs Pool back when he was 67. Here's my dad. 
It's called a watermelon. Or this next one. Flip and a half twist. Yeah, you should have heard the Barton Springs crowd, you know, in that moment. He's always been so active. And then all of a sudden this summer, what we heard had been Alzheimer's in addition to it was cancer. Now, the beauty is I have to tell you that we had many opportunities to say goodbye. And some of us have not had that opportunity. And I've lost family members before. I've lost close friends before. I've helped with many funerals, but something about losing my dad, it's been really hard. And I can tell you that part of what's helped me through this is the way you're, you have reflected the image of God to us. Your calls, your texts, your invitations, your hugs, your love in the midst of all this. But I have to tell you, there was a moment just a few weeks ago before he died where I was really struggling. And I've had lots of really great moments in prayer and in worship in my own time. In fact, I feel like I've grown in that this summer. Because there's desperation in my prayers and in my heart. But in one of those times, I just, and I'm going to confess out loud, I just prayed, God, I need what I say I believe to be true. I need it to be true. God showed me that what I've been teaching all these years is real. And there have been so many remarkable moments since then. As hard as the doubt has been, as hard as those days where I didn't want to get out of bed have been. I'll share just a a few of them. After my dad died, Deborah and I drove to be with my mom. And my brother was on his way as well. And that afternoon, after trying to help her around the house and at the memory care center where he lived for a couple weeks, We started sharing stories about my dad. My mom is super outgoing, super bubbly and and loving, and my dad is a little bit more of like a handshake and and not hugs kind of guy, more of an action and not words kind of guy. And so we were asking, like, when was dad really at his happiest? Like, when was he really ever happy? And my mom said, well, he was really looked good when we got married. And he really looked good at officer training school graduation. Like, we didn't say, when did he look good? We said, when was he at his happiest? And she said, well, when you look good, you feel good. (laughs) It's like, that's not what we were going for, Mom. That's not exactly what we're looking for. So uh, we drove home that night, and we were going to come back the next day. And and I texted my brothers, like, ask Mom while you're still there, was he happiest maybe when we were born? Like, maybe that'll jar her memory for, like, moments when he was really happy. Because we have a lot of pictures of our dad, and he's not smiling. He was annoyed with all the pictures my mom wanted to take. And my brother, immediately after I asked, ask mom about when we were born, if dad was happy, he sent back this picture of me and my dad. He's beaming. I don't remember that picture. Of course, I don't remember that moment. But I I then, as we went back the next day, we started finding picture after picture of my dad with the biggest smiles. Picture with him with my son, Caleb, playing on the ground. Or with my daughter, carrying her on his shoulders. It was like God knew I needed to see these pictures. I needed to know this about my dad. God was comforting me, comforting me in the midst of that. Well, on that night, second night, driving back to my mom's, I mean, the sunset was gorgeous. We have amazing sunsets in central Texas. But for some reason, this time really struck me. And I remember that prayer. As I saw the sunset, I remember that prayer, that I needed proof. And as I was looking out of the, over the lake in the house where my parents lived, my grandparents lived since 1971, it goes way back in the family, I took this picture of the lake, of the sunset. And there's no filter. I'm not a good photographer. I was using an iPhone. That helps a great deal. <laughs> but just that rain in the distance and the color in the clouds... I just felt overwhelmed with how God is so powerful. And then I have to tell you that I, I, and by the way, there's way more proof. There is a God and there is life after death than just that picture I took. (laughs) Read, imagine heaven, look at the scriptures, talk with others who followed God. And I have to tell you, when my dad died, I didn't read the Bible that day and I didn't read the Bible the next day. It wasn't that I was angry. I was just, honestly, I was just kind of numb. There's lots to do. And I decided to read 
the Bible and go to God through his word. Like, God, speak to me. I, st I still need help. I need hope. And I came across this verse, Psalm 27. This was the verse of the day. I, I didn't know where to even look. So I just went to my Bible app and just looked at the verse of the day, which says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I needed to hear that. I ended up reading the whole psalm, which talks about how God is our light and salvation. There's no reason to fear that he invites us to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then it said, though your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will receive you. Now, my parents have never not been there for me, but my dad is physically no longer here. And I remember reading that, thinking God was reminding me he will be there for me. See, one of the things that helped me come to peace with my dad years and years ago was realizing I had unrealistic expectations of him. I think we all do of others. We expect our parents or our siblings or our spouse or our friends to meet some of our deepest needs that only God can truly meet. But the, the verse right before, verse 14, says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I was so encouraged. I felt like God was just speaking to me, answering my prayer. And then the next day, it was this one. John 11 says this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Then it has, Jesus asked, do you believe this? God was asking me, do you believe this? And I was able to say, yes, I do. There's another miraculous moment. I shared a, I couldn't even share it two weeks ago. It was the day, my last chance to see my dad. And I may not be able to share it now, but I'm going to try. But my brother had told me the last day he saw him was a Sunday morning. It was about 5.30 in the morning because he had to drive all the way five hours back to East Texas and he told me, he's like, it was amazing. I was crying and dad comforted me. He just started patting me on the back as I hugged him. He said, I think I figured out why we never felt that emotional connection from dad. We were never up early enough. <laughs> he's like, you got to go early and see if you can catch dad before his defenses are up. And so Tuesday morning, I got up about five o'clock, drove the hour and 15 minutes to where my dad was staying. And I got there and he was asleep. And at this point, this whole last week, he'd really been asleep all the time. He was in so much pain, and they had him on morphine and all these things. But I still had a moment with my dad. And I held his hand, and it wasn't limp, but it wasn't, he didn't squeeze my hand either. But it, I held his hand, and I just told him how much I loved him, how grateful I was for him. I told him I was sorry for anything I may have done that hurt him. I told him I'd forgive him, knowing that he never wanted to hurt me. And I told him that you can find rest. You don't have to hang on anymore. You can find rest. I played a couple songs in the room with him, and he never really woke up. I didn't get what I had been looking for. I didn't have that moment until I walked out of the room. And as I walked out of the room, a little sweet old lady was standing there, like she was waiting for me. And I looked at her, and I said, uh, do you need something? And she looked confused. Now, this is an Alzheimer's unit, so that's probably how she truly felt. <laughs> and I said to her, or she said to me in that moment, after I asked her and she looked confused, she said, what is your name? And she put out her hand. So I put out my hand, I, I shook her hand, and then she grabbed my hand with her other hand. And I told her my name. I asked her hers. And then she looked at me and she said, can I give you a kiss? And I said, Sure. So I turned my cheek, she gave me a kiss on my cheek, and then still holding my hand, she looks at me with the brightest smile, and she just says, you are a good man. And then I said, can I give you a hug? So I give her a hug, she hugs me back, I wish her a good day, and I leave. And I'm just kind of shocked. See, what happened in that moment was, God gave me what my dad never could give me. Not because my dad was a bad dad, but because he's a human being. My heavenly father knew exactly what I needed. 
And he gave it through Caroline. Her name's Caroline, which I found out later from Amber. Caroline means a free one. God was telling me that I'm free. I don't have to worry or wonder if I got everything I needed or if I said everything I said. Yeah. But that's the kind of God that we follow, one who knows our deepest needs and can meet our, those needs when we turn to him. See, God revealed himself to me. Have you allowed God to reveal himself to you? And I believe God will when we ask him, when we seek him. This last week, we did a, a bit of an experiment. It was a really beautiful moment. We gave six artists of different ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, blank canvases. We didn't give them any direction. We just simply played some music and said, paint what you feel. It was beautiful to capture the process of them creating, these artists creating something from nothing. Watch this.
I'm holding an original artwork from Ashley Higgins, age seven. We had John Lee, we had Layla Echiona, Don Tate, all from Gateway South, along with a few others. And I want you to think for a moment, this was a blank canvas. And it was really just a, an idea in her mind that she was able to put on this space. And not only that, not only did we have six artists creating, but Aaron Ojeda and Kelsey and Hannah just singing that original song that the others wrote. And then an editor putting together the video. And if these creatives can, can do something so beautiful, what on earth could the creator of the universe do with your life? With my life when we put our hands in the when we put our life in the hands of the master artist the scriptures tell us we become his masterpiece Ephesians 2 10 for we are God's handiwork his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do you may be thinking you have nothing to offer God can take nothing and do something beautiful with it. He can take the masterpiece that may be covered in the mud and he can bring the cleaning and the healing that you need. And then he can take the worst moments of our life and somehow make us better through it. And so I want to invite you in this moment as we finish this series to consider, are you allowing God to guide you to become who he's created you to be? Are you living out your purpose? It begins by having a relationship with him through Jesus. And it continues as we stay connected, as we move into that relationship, growing in that relationship, but also in community with his children. So I just wanna pray for us in this moment and ask that God might show each of us what our next step may be to becoming who he's created us. Heavenly Father, I just pray for courage for each one of us. Speak to us. Put a thought in our mind that may be our next step. It could be something as revolutionary as asking you for forgiveness for the very first time and asking you to lead us, accepting the fact that what Jesus did on the cross is something we need. We need forgiveness and we need a new direction in our life. Perhaps, God, we might need the courage to just reconnect with you, to restart this relationship with you. Perhaps you're calling us into something deeper that we've been afraid to step into. Perhaps you're calling us into community, into loving and sharing and being that light at work. God, whatever it is you're calling us to, give us the courage to step into that. And God, for those of us that are in the midst of a, a trial, a struggle, loss, if we're overwhelmed and we're just barely able to survive, God, would you help us to surrender the pain as well? And God, we entrust to you those who are hurting, knowing that you can be there for those in the Ukraine, those in Florida, those in Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic who've lost everything. God, be with them. May they reach out to you and know that you are there. God, I've been overwhelmed with how real you are in my own life. May each of us in this room experience that as we seek you. Show us our next step, God. Give us the courage that we might become who you created us to be. In Jesus' name I pray.